So we're going to uh, continue our study when the lights go on so I can see what our study... There we go. And the pastor said, let there be light. That was cool. <laughs> yeah, okay. Somebody in the back said, okay. Amen. Yeah, so, you know, we got a lot of people not feeling well, and we just need to keep them in prayer and, and know that... Uh, boy, it's really hit this area, hasn't it? It's just like... It's like decimated. I, I, I went to work the other day and there was literally a skeleton crew. I, I couldn't believe how many people were just not there and it was all because of sickness and it's not just the adults of course it's children and people have to stay home and things of that nature so um, we just really need to be continuing to pray for each other and strengthen each other. So I'm going to read our, our text. Uh, uh, next week I'm going to be doing an interview with a branch and uh, you won't want to miss it because I'm bringing in a literal branch and I'm going to interview it. It's going to talk to us. So, um, but we're doing a, a new study called The Way to a Fruitful Life, Abiding in the Vine. And this morning I just, um, I have some, uh, some thoughts for us that, that really have been on my heart through this study. And um, I just, I'm so thankful because, you know, when, you, when you're in a, a chapter or, or a portion of Scripture... Uh, especially as a pastor, when you're starting to uh, tease through it and you're trying to draw out from it. This is one of those chapters and, and, and a set of verses that, uh, that you go through. And you could spend literally in the, in the five verses that we're going to read. You, you, I believe I could, I could probably do this for a whole year just on the five verses, breaking them down. There's, that, there's just that much information. It's that much Encouragement. There's that much teaching that the Lord would have for us. But John chapter 15, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, the first five verses says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may be more fruitful. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Verse 6 says, if, you, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. A lot of people don't like that last verse. And we won't major on it until the end today. But last week, as I said, um, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit background. We began our new study. And I stated that the following in our introduction, I encouraged us to read and reread this text. I encouraged us to memorize it and to digest it, to take the Word of God and take it as the bread of life and eat it and, and begin to digest what these verses are, especially the first five verses, but I would say the first uh, ten verses of John chapter 15. I also shared last week <clears throat> that I believe that our text would lead us to a place of new life. And, you know, spring is March 19th this year. It's not that far off. We're actually about six weeks away, which I'm excited about. Woohoo! Come on now. And spring to me is just, you know, it's, it's, it's my favorite because of, because of the resurrection. It's, it's, we call it Easter, I know, but that, that season to me is, I, I'd rather celebrate Easter than Christmas. If I had to choose one, it would definitely be hands down Easter. Hands down, it would be Easter weekend more than Christmas. It would just be hands down. I love it because of the time of year it is. It's springtime. It, it's, it's, it's a time for new vegetation to come up. But it also speaks of, you know, think about it. It speaks almost of the winter, fall, winter, and, and spring together of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And to me, it's a time of resurrection. It's a time of new life. It's a time to enjoy. But, but I found out in my walk that even when we're going through discouraging times, even when we're going through battles, even when we're going through sicknesses or whatever we're going through, that, that the Lord Jesus intended for us to bear fruit through all those seasons. That he wanted us to bear fruit, and he wanted us to bear a lot of fruit. 
And, and we're eventually going to go to the fruits of the Spirit, which I'll read at the end of our time together today. And why it's important to understand that there's, there's a, a spiritual fruit that every believer in Christ has been called to cultivate and to call to, to have in their lives. Unlike when you look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, not all believers are necessarily called to function in all the nine gifts of the Spirit. But when you go to the, the, the book of Galatians, and it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, we are all called to have all of the fruit of the Spirit. Not just one or two of them, but all of them. So unlike the gifts which are dispersed by the Lord at His sovereignty and His will, not everybody's going to function in all nine of the gifts. But you can function in all of the gifts or the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we're actually called to. Did you know that? We're actually called to. And so our text will lead us, I hope, to a place of new life. And I mean just, I mean, I mean new life, that it will be life in us, that will be, regardless of what time of the year it is, what the calendar says, that we, we can still thrive in our spiritual walk. How many of you are like that? How many of you would like that? And how much of that would be a, a black eye to the enemy that you're thriving during a time that he's attacking you and coming against you? So our text will lead us, and I believe it has already begun, to a place that's a new season. Our text will show us how to produce more fruit. How many of you want more fruit in your life? Right? I'm not talking about fruit loops. I'm talking about true fruit. Okay? I want more fruit. Our text will show us how to maintain, and this is important, maintain a fruitful life beyond, like I said, whatever time of the year it is. How to maintain it. And our text will teach us how to live fruitful lives in Christ. Our text will teach us how to be fruitful and multiply. Isn't that incredible that God's command to the first humans was be fruitful and multiply? So from the very beginning of creation, it was God's desire for mankind, for you and I, to be fruitful and to multiply. And that, that, that's, that's what we're called to do as Christians. When Jesus restored as the last Adam the order of all things, one of the things that he's teaching here is that he wanted the original design that was created back in the garden to, to come to fruition in us here in the earth, and that is that we would be fruitful and multiply. And then our text, lastly, will teach us how to live in a way that fruit will be plentiful in our lives. Where fruit will be plentiful. I also shared with us something I thought was really, really important about this text. What does Jesus start off with? He says, I am the true vine. Right? Well, this is the last of the I am's that Jesus uses in John's gospel. And this is what we call his farewell discourse or his farewell address. And I, I think about this a lot uh, as I was thinking about it. I said it kind of in, in passing last week, but it's really true. You know, and as a pastor, I've had many times that I've been in either a hospice or hospital care where somebody is ebbing away and their, their last days are upon them. And, and especially those who are somewhat conscious and are still communicating during that time. What I have found is so um, profound, really, is that somebody's last words are are really important. And I have yet to be at a, 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 an experience like that where somebody says to me, especially when I'm talking to them, to them alone and asking them if, they, if there's anything that they would like to talk about or pray about as they know and pretty much everybody in the room knows or everybody knows in their family that, that there is, a, um, you know, the end days are coming for them. I ask them, I, I have yet to have somebody say to me, you know, Pastor, I, I wish I would have worked a little bit more. I wish I had worked that overtime shift that they offered me six years ago. Most of the time what they say to me is, you know what, I, I, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I wish I would have spent more time praying. I wish I would have spent more time cultivating my relationships, the healthy ones, my relationship with God more. You know, I, I, I think of you know, those type of things and, and, and cultivating. I think of Billy Graham, one of the things he said, I think it was about two years before he passed away. Now, he was in his 90s, I believe, when he passed away. And 
Now, this is Billy Graham, and I'm thinking to myself, what an answer he gives here. They said, what would you do? What's the one thing that you would do different in your life? Now, this is Billy Graham. We're not talking about me. We're talking about Billy Graham here. He says, I wish I would have spent more time reading my Bible. Huh? Are you kidding me? What is he saying? He's saying that even at the end of his life, he realizes that there were times that he could, that he should have been maybe in the Word of God more. He just felt like, I should have been more in the Word of God. That's Billy Graham. And I'm going, holy cow, I fall way short. Right? Anybody else? Uh, yeah. But last words are important, aren't they? And maybe some of you are thinking about loved ones of yours that you were around and they gave you some last words of maybe encouragement or said some things to you that, that you hide in your heart. Because last words are important. The last conversations we have with people mean something. And this is Jesus' farewell discourse or his farewell address. And, 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 and I really believe from chapter 13 of John's Gospel up until he is actually taken before the Sanhedrin and before the council, that those chapters, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and of course his high priestly prayer, 17, but 13, 14, 15, and 16 of John's Gospel, to me, are some of the most important words that Jesus spoke because this was his last night that he spoke. It took three chapters, or four chapters, actually five when you look at 17, it took five chapters to capture what Jesus said on his last night. This is his last night. Chapter 15 is in the middle of him speaking to them. Chapter 13 and 14, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit in chapter 14, and about being comforted. And then he goes, let's get up from here. <laughs> Excuse me. And he says, I, I, and if you look at the end of chapter 14, it says, uh, it says this. The last words were, arise, let us go from here. And what's he doing? He get, they're getting up from the, from the uh, uh, table, the Last Supper. They've done communion. And he begins to start walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, via going through a vineyard. And so Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples, he's beginning to give them even more instruction or give them more encouragement or give them more of his last and farewell address. He's teaching us something and he's teaching and he, and he, he wants them to know, but he also wants us to know something about the way of being a fruitful child of God. And last week was so important, I believe, in the life of this church. I said to my wife, I said it to leaders, I said it to people. I actually said it to other Christians that I was talking to this week when they said, Hey, how was your service? I said, You know what? To me, it was one of the most important messages I think I've ever preached in 13 years at this church. And they said, Really? Why? I said, Because it was a call to repentance. It was a call to get rid of those root areas in our hearts that would keep us from allowing the nutrients and the sap of the true vine Jesus to flow in our lives so that we would be the most fruitful. So that we could be fruitful Christians. That we would get rid of those things. And, and, and can I just camp out here for a minute? I'm asking a rhetorical question. I'm going to do it anyway. But we need to camp out here for a minute. We, we, we need to make sure that our, you know, I think it was 2000 and... Uh, I think it was 2011, I'm um, pretty sure it was actually, uh, I, I had a heart episode and it required that they went up and they had to blow something into my heart to see if I had you know, any clogs. And I remember the nurse saying to, to us that, uh, or the doctor saying, we're going to do this because we think you have blockage and, and we're going to take you to this hospital, we're going to do the test and then we're going to keep the ambulance there and then we're going to take you to another hospital and we're going to probably have to put either a stent or do open heart surgery. I said, okay. So somebody, uh, some great friends of ours who were leaders in Foursquare at the time here locally, came up and prayed. And as they prayed, they, they, they said, you know, I just felt like the Lord showed me that your, whatever was in your heart was moved away. And I said, okay, that's cool. So the next day I go for this test. And this thing, I, I won't get too graphic, but they went all the way up and got into my heart. And they blew this dye into my heart. And he said, it was going to be super, super hot. And it, it, it just, whoosh, wow. And... The doctor came back and said to my wife and I, she said, you know, we're not going to have to do surgery. She goes, because whatever is there was just blown out, just gone. Just gone. And I think, thank God. Right? Because I, I didn't want to be cracked open. 
I had a couple weeks off of work, but other than that, that's not worth it. Right? Let's take a vacation. But I think about that in the spirit realm. What's in our hearts? You know, what's in your wallet? What's in your heart? And, and, and what might be blocking the flow of the nutrients from the true vine? The sap, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. The Holy Spirit is the sap. And, and what's in our hearts? Is it, is it pride? Is, is it arrogance? Is it, is it uh, um, hatred or unforgiveness or bitterness or resentments? Or what's in our hearts? Is it... Is it something else that's been undetected and maybe others can't see, but inside you're rotting? I have a good friend who pastors up in northern New York, what Susanna and I do, and, and you know, he's been here. And, and one of the things, uh, I was talking to one of his members, because they do a lot of, um, of tree cutting and logging up in that area. And I asked him, this, this one gentleman, this was many years ago, was, was a member of his church. I, I think he's still there. And he's an arborist, a true arborist. He's known for, um, he's a tree doctor. And he, he really knows how to take care and cultivate trees. And, and I, we were talking about it. And I said, I said, so, you know, how long, you know, tell me about what you do. And he, he, we got in this conversation. Somewhere in the conversation, this came. And I thought this was interesting. He said, you know that a tree can be dead for decades before you ever see that it's dead and the outward. And I said, what do you mean? He said, in the tree, there's a heart. I never knew this. And the heart of the tree could die 10 or 15, 20 years ago, but you don't know that the tree is dead, even though it's producing some kind of fruit, but it's not producing the fruit that it was at its optimum level. It's been dead, and it's just taking time for the, for the death of the heart to spread through the whole tree. Now think about it. I don't want to be that tree. That heart issues are keeping me from being able to get through. And then 20 years or 10 years later, that bitterness or that unforgiveness or that, that hatred or that anger or the, the lust or the pride or the air, whatever it is, has killed them off the areas of my heart that I can't get the vine can't get its sap in. It can't get its nutrients in. The word of God can't be planted here because it just bounces off like Jesus talked about the seeds. The heart is hard because of life, because things happen. And last week we spoke about that. And I, 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 I came away and I've been meditating on last week. I almost preached it again. Because it's just like that procedure I had. I, I, I began to feel last week that we were clean. That there was some cleaning that went on here last week. And people talked about how they felt like they were reborn again. And, and, and that, that there was something in their hearts that changed. Whatever it is, I, I implore you. I, I tell you as your pastor, as your brother in Christ, as a, as a friend in Christ. Don't let anything be in your heart that would keep you from, from being able to receive because sometimes the sap doesn't come directly the way we think it does. It might come from brother to brother or sister to sister and you might not be able to receive from them because your heart is clogged up with all this gunk. It's so important. It's so important that, we, that we, we don't let our hearts become clogged up because Jesus is teaching us how to be fruitful, how to be a fruitful vine, how, to, uh, how fruitfulness is important to the Christian life. And we talked last week about sour grapes from Isaiah 5 where God the Father, the vine dresser, was, came to see his, 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 his vineyard that he had planted. He came to see if there was any fruit there. And when he came, what ended up happening? He, he found grapes there, didn't he? He found fruit, but it was sour grapes, it says. It was wild grapes, but the translation is sour. And the worst part of the translation is it was stinking grapes. You ever smell putrid fruit? It's just delightful, isn't it? And guess what you find with putrid fruit? You find all these little fruit, fruit flies, which represent spirits of darkness in the scripture the flies and that's what happens we have this putrid and by the way then we begin to smell putrid we smell like the fruit that we're producing and no one wants to be around us no one wants to be around us 
And there are three thoughts that we establish as we move on. We have to establish these three thoughts. First one, Jesus is what in this? He's the vine. That's important, right? To know who we're supposed to be engrafted in. Jesus. Thought number two, very basic stuff here I'm teaching. This is like 101. We are the branches. Right? And I'm very serious. We've we got to establish this because this is important stuff moving on. And next week we're going to have a guest speaker, the branch. And when the branch comes, you need to hear from the branch next week. And by the way, unless you're sick or you just can't make it, you really need to be here. You need to really branch out and come. Karaching. Should have a rim shot machine, right? Ding. Make sure you don't leaf us next week, but be here. I got, I got more. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. And the Father, Father God, is the husbandman or the owner of the vineyard. Of the vineyard. So, who's the, who's the vine? Who's the branch? And who's the owner? God the Father. As a branch, you are, and I are given a simple task, but yet this task seems to be elusive to us. It, it, it's actually, a, have you ever found out that sometimes the most simpler things are the hardest things to do? Anybody agree with that? Sometimes the very simplest thing, and you say, no, no, no. Yeah, Christianity is very simple. Did you know that? But we've complicated it. Christianity is, boils down to three commandments, which I'll talk about in a moment. It's love God, love others, and make disciples. That's simple. Jesus said all the rest of the Old Testament hinges on two things, love God, love others. It's that simple. But how hard is it to do? Oh, I'm perfecting it. No, well, you're not. Come on, let's be honest. It's hard, isn't it? Simple things are hard to do sometimes. I always say this. and I got this from a colleague of mine many years ago. And we know when you go into a jail or prison, they search you, right? That's what they do. Because they don't want you to have what? What do you say? Contraband. They don't want you to bring something in you shouldn't bring. It's called contraband. And I always say, yep. Yeah. Sometimes in life, contraband, common sense is contraband. People just don't use common sense sometimes. And sometimes it's just simple. So what is it? What is it? We have a simple task here. We as branches are literally given two, maybe three things to observe. Maybe two or three duties as branches. We only have two or three things as branches that we need to do. One is so simple, but yet it's so difficult. One is this. Get this. Abide in the vine. Abide in the vine. Be connected, stay connected, live connected to the vine. Second, is that from the vine, we are to receive sap and nourishment from the vine. Because we're abiding... Now, we're going to receive nourishment and sap. And thirdly, as a result of the first two, because we're abiding and he's sending his nutrients and his sap to us, now we get to bear fruit. Three things. It almost sounds like loving God, loving people, and making disciples. Well, what does it mean to abide? Abide literally means hold to, stick to, conform to, obey, and comply with. That's what we're supposed to do when we're abiding in Jesus as the vine. It's so much more, though. What is, the key, what is the key to living the blessed branch life that is possible? What is the key for us to abide in such a way that we, we, we bear much fruit? Because, again, can I tell you something, folks? You're a branch. Look at somebody and say, hey, you're a branch. Okay? You're a branch. You're a branch of the vine, Jesus. You are a branch. And my job is his job in me, but through me, the job that the Lord has given me to do through this series is to get us to a place where you get everything cleared away in your life that you possibly know of and that God shows you so that you can bear much fruit. Not just some fruit. Much fruit.
And by the way, what if we, we talked about the fig tree that Jesus cursed? Do you know why Jesus cursed the fig tree? There are several reasons, but I'm going to give you one practical one. One was very practical. He saw from afar off, like me, me looking at Tim back there in the sound booth. He saw from afar off what he thought was a fruitful fig tree. And he was hungry. Pretty simple. Jesus got hungry. And he says, oh, a fig tree. I'm going to go have some figs with Newton. And so he goes over and he, Newton was one of his disciples, wasn't he? And so he goes to the fig tree. And because the fig tree has these big leaves, you, do, you, do you remember who covered themselves with figs? Do you know something about fig leaves? They shrink once you pick them. So they covered themselves and it began to shrink immediately. But in his eyes, Jesus sees this big fig tree, got big leaves. And what's, it, what's that speak of to you if you're looking at it? More fruit. There's some fruit there. There's some figs there. So he goes up to it and he lifts up in a sense the, 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 the leaf to go grab a fig. And guess what? There's not. There's no, no fruit. Can I tell you, don't be a fig tree? Don't look like on the exterior like you got something going on that you don't. Because what did Jesus do to that fig tree? He cursed it. They walked away. And when they came back by it later, it was, it was dead. It died. It died. To abide as a branch in Jesus means that we do one thing in abiding. It means that we come to a place of absolute dependence on the vine. Absolute dependence. We must recognize that the branch, you, me, we have nothing in our own self. We don't give anything back to the vine. Did you know that? You don't feed the vine. The vine feeds you. You don't produce fruit on your own. It's only from you and the vine being together and you understanding as a branch, you are 100%, not 99, not 98, not 97, not 96 or 95, not even 94 or 93, not even 92 or 91 or 90. Do you want me to go all the way to zero? Okay, but you get it? Not even 89 or 88, not even 87 or 86. No, you are 100%, not 85 or 84, you are 100, not 83 or 82 or 81 or 80, you are 100% dependent on the vine. Because that is what he's saying here. He's telling them that if you're going to bear as much fruit as possible, and as I want you to, to, to have, and as the Father wants you to have, you're going to have to be 100% dependent on me. Abiding is total dependence on the vine. In this case, it is total dependence on Jesus. When we understand this need for our branch life to live, it's an absolute dependence we will become more fruitful. You see, what it means is we stop trying to do it ourselves. We, we, we stop having these fig leaves or these leaves on us that we kind of put together for ourselves and that we produce on our own and we call it fruit. Jesus says, no, there's no fruit there. Or that there is, there's stinking grapes or sour grapes. All of our duties of life, whether we go to work, whether we are at home, should flow from this simple thought. All of our duties should flow from this consciousness, whether it be at work, home, in the church, that we must be in total dependence on the vine. That I am in total dependence on the vine. How does the vine fulfill the trust of our dependence? What does he do to us? He gives us sap to flow in our lives. I love the fact that the Bible says, according to Paul, as he wrote, he said that the Holy Spirit was given to us as a down payment or a guarantee to our salvation in this side of eternity. 
Now, the sap doesn't just flow to give us a special gift. The sap is to flow in our lives hourly, daily, and get this, without measure. Without measure. When you are 100% dependent upon the vine, and your, your branch is in good place to receive, your heart, we talked about fallow ground last week, hard ground, that has to be broken up. You see, I lived in farm country outside of Detroit. I lived in farm country, and every year the, the, the people that owned the, the land that our, our farm uh, abutted up against, when we would, every springtime, we would see that family come down, and they had about 100, 120 acres, and it was mainly used for alfalfa or corn or hay or whatever. They would come down with their tractors, and their tractors, they wouldn't just drive over the, no. Um, behind in the tractors, they had these big cultivators, that tillers, and they cultivated the land. And you could see, and one of the things that happened, especially in, in, at, at times of the spring, is you could smell the earth. You could smell the minerals. You could smell the nutrients. You could smell it. It was like, whoa. And then you would start, you know, then what they would do, and they would ask us to come, and they would, once in a while, we'd go in, and we would help them get out all the rocks. And they would have a tractor with a big trailer, and rocks, boom, boom, get out all the rocks, right? And then they would till it up, and, they, and, and it was fun, because if it was got, as it would get warm, we would start seeing snakes on our land, because the snakes were coming from the untilled ground, and We'd see snakes, and it was cool to see. But all of these things, the ground had to be broken up. You know, the, the farmer couldn't come down and just go, Bruh, it's springtime, a little muddy, yay, good, we can do it. It's springtime, spring rain. No, he had to till up the ground. He had to get rid of the hard places. He had to get the rocks, and anything that would choke off the seed had to get out. And the word of God is the seed of life. It's the bread of life, yes, but it's the seed and if we have anything in our heart toward God, toward others, we have anything that we're holding on to. Dear one, I tell you, I implore you, get that stone out of there. Get that thing out of there because the sap cannot flow to you if you've got blockage. And Jesus wants you to live alive. He wants you to live with, with freedom. He wants you to live in fruitfulness. He wants you to live regardless of what you're going through. He wants you to be fruitful so you can multiply what he's given you in your life. But you can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in and through your life. Thank you. The sap from the vine doesn't stop flowing. It doesn't just flow Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or on Sunday morning, or, or at a church service. No, the sap flows continually in the life of the branch from the vine. It doesn't flow and then stop. And then begin to flow again. The sap is a continuous flow from the vine to the branches. And guess what? Get this. This is the beautiful part of it. There's enough sap for everyone. There's enough sap for every branch. There's, a, there's an overflow of sap for every branch. Everyone that's connected, everyone that is abiding, there is so much sap available it's it's not limited this absolute dependence on the vine is the key to living the absolute most fruitful christian life people say no i think it's you know going out and evangelizing i think it's going out and preaching i think it's going out and doing this i think it's winning souls i think it's that that's a fruitful life those are the results of a fruitful life that's not what makes you fruitful what makes you fruitful is you're abiding in the vine and your absolute dependence on Him. We must understand that as branches, we have nothing unless it flows from the vine. Our life source is based on the vine flowing into the branches. And we must decide to be the type of branches, if we're going to be fruitful, that are dependent 100% on the vine for everything in our lives. 
There are two types of branches, by the way. And, and, and they're the two types that Jesus mentions in our text. There's only two types of branches. The ones that are connected to the vine that are unfruitful, or say that they're a part of the vine uh, that are unfruitful, and the ones that are pruned. And the vine dresser does two things to ensure maximum fruit productions in our lives. First of all, this is the most painful one to hear. He will remove the dead or fruitful areas of our lives. He will remove the dead or unfruitful areas of our lives. He will remove the things that produce death. Because he can't produce life until he does. Anything that does not bear fruit from the vine, what Jesus said, is removed from the vine. This is going to be a tough word for some of us to hear this morning. In our text, the indication is that there are those who claim to be Christ, but are not. Just like not everybody who goes to church is a Christian. Any more than going to McDonald's makes you a french fry. Just because people sit in church doesn't mean that they're Christian. And, 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 and using the Christian tag, which used to be more popular than it is today, was something thrown around that we just thought, oh, because you, you, know, you go to church, you must be a Christian. That's not true. Matter of fact, unfortunately, there are people who don't go to church who are more Christian than people who go to church. They call themselves by the term Christian, but they're unfruitful branches. And guess what? They're removed from among the healthy and true branches. Why? Because not all who say to Jesus are genuine believers. You say, what? Turn in your Bible to John chapter 6. These are people... In John chapter 6, who followed Jesus, were fed by Jesus. Get this, you got to hear this, please. They were fed by Jesus. Jesus ministered to them. They walked with Jesus. Get this, they turned to somebody and said, hey, these people walked with Jesus. And look at verse 66. After this, after some teaching that Jesus gave... Many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Let that sink in for a minute. They were called disciples, followers. And because of what he taught, because of the word of God, they turned around and walked the opposite direction and no longer walked with him. We don't know if any of them were restored or not. We don't know. But if you need more, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Because I know that this is not a popular word in the church today. We want to believe that everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going into the kingdom of heaven. We want to believe that everyone who sits in our churches, we want to believe that everyone who goes to our church meetings is going to heaven. And let me tell you, it is, you know, I, I am thankful. And Yahya, thank you for letting me be at the funeral on Monday. I am thankful that I knew that Mike knew the Lord. Because it is so much easier doing a farewell when you know. But just because somebody comes to church, this church, that church, up there church, anywhere church, just because they sit there Sunday after Sunday, they may not know the Lord. Did you know that? You say, that's not possible, Pastor. According to Jesus, it is. Let's look in chapter 7, verse 15 and following. Beware of false prophets. So there's going to even be leaders in the church. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their what? By their, by, by what? By their clothes? By their jet? By their ministry? 
by their fruit, and keep reading now, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the, dis, the, but the diseased trees bear bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? And then what? Thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And guess what? He doesn't stop there. And there's more. Let's keep reading. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the what? The will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. So they're calling Jesus Lord. Get this. This is important. These are people who recognize that Jesus is what? Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, this is Jesus speaking. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Them are some pretty serious scriptures. And guess what? They're found in the New Testament. And it's the Lord Jesus who spoke them. Fruitfulness, abiding, is very important to our Lord. It's very important. Some want us to believe that Jesus didn't mean what he said. Did you know that? I'm serious. There are people who want to fit in to the text what's not there. I want to tell you, I've said this a hundred more times than a hundred since I've been here in this church and I've taught here. And when you're reading the scripture, you are never called to read into it. You are called to draw out of it. You read into it, that's you. You draw out, that's him. You draw out from the well. People don't want, they don't want, they don't believe what Jesus said was what he said. When he said, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers. And the branches that are thrown away are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. End quote. Jesus' words. Not mine. Do I want that to happen? No. Do I want that to happen to people that are sitting in this ministry? No. Do I want that to happen to anyone that I know? No. It's hard to hear, isn't it? We can't just pick out the good stuff that we want to hear. We got to hear it all. It's difficult for our hearts to wrap around these words because we, we've heard people in the world say, well, if God is so loving and so kind, why would he send anyone to hell? It's a great question, isn't it? I think it is. But he has to if they don't know him. Some would say that the term that Jesus used in the Greek, which is arrow, which is Greek for lifts up, is a grace word. And it could be, meaning that an unfruitful vine, or an unfruitful branch, I'm sorry, not a vine, would be lifted up from the ground to become more fruitful. And that is true. If it's been on the ground and it's soiled and dirty, the Lord Jesus will definitely lift up that leaf and clean it off and reestablish it. He'll do that. I want to balance this, okay? He'll do that. However... Jesus said, not Pastor Eric, not well-meaning people. Jesus stated that the unfruitful branches are thrown into the fire. However, pruning is a grace word. That suggests grace in the life of a true branch. And can I tell you something? That pruning more than likely will involve pain. 
One of my favorite things to do in a few months is I get to go out to my raspberry bush. And I, every year, cut away and I prune. And there are usually a handful of dead branches that I have to take out. And can I tell you something? I can't fit them back in. As much as I would like to, and I even talk to them. I know I'm weird. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I have to throw you in the wheelbarrow now. Because you're not going to be any, you're not going to do anything but choke off the good fruit if I leave you here. And I and I I, I rake around it to get all the stuff out, any anything that debris wise that's there, even if it's natural debris from the winter, and I get it all out and I make sure. And last year I had so many raspberries I didn't know what to do with them. I'm serious. And, it, and it, when you look at the raspberry bush, from if you had seen it at the beginning of the year, and then saw what I did to it, and, and you'd been like, wow, Pastor, you, you buzz-cutted that thing. And yet, it gave us a beautiful harvest in July. And I had to remove what needed to be removed. And I'm sure if that raspberry vine or bush could talk to me, some of those branches would be kicking and screaming, go, wait a minute, I've been a part of this for a long time. What's going on? Uh-uh, you died off. I can't use you anymore. I can't even replant you. Pruning suggests grace. Actually, it's far more gracious of the Lord than the other. You see, the Greek word used for pruning here literally refers to making it clean or to clean up. To clean it up so that it can have a flow in it again so that the sap can flow again and this is why abiding is so important folks so the question this morning is very simple because I don't want I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this I'm not going to close with this thought I'm going to close with a more happier thought but the fire here, and if you read commentaries that are been accepted for centuries, the fire here represents the final judgment. Unless you don't believe me, you can also look in, in at the latter part of Matthew's gospel where Jesus says, one day, on judgment day, I'm going to take the sheep and the goats and I'm going to separate them. And the one will be on my left, the other will be on my right, and the, and the goats are goats who actually were in church who did a lot of things for the church and in the church and he's going to say the same thing depart from me you workers of iniquity I never knew you but to his sheep you see there's several times and this is this is, you know you say so are we going to have goat meat at the last supper I don't know it's a joke I know this that there is going to be a time that there are going to be people that thought or believed because they went to church that they are okay eternally. And it's a religion versus relationship. It's abiding versus doing your own thing. It's dependency upon interdependency or dependent on self. And I'm telling you that there's coming a day that Jesus spoke of many times in Scripture that he will separate, whether it's the branches or whether it's the goats and the sheep, he will separate and the goats and the dead branches or the ones that didn't produce life, that did not abide in the true vine, will be cast away for eternity into a fiery destruction that will never last. I have to say it. If I don't, I'm not preaching the whole gospel. But here's the good news. If you're a branch that's abiding, and maybe you've you're, you're been on the ground and gotten soiled, the Lord will lift you up and clean you and cultivate you so that you can begin to start having nutrients. But there's going to be some pruning that has to take place. And I'm sure if my rose, or rose, my, my raspberry 
plant could talk to me when I'm taking my shears and I'm it wouldn't be going oh that feels so good I've been waiting all winter it would be going oh 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 whoa right it wouldn't be going what a relief to get rid of that eventually it will but not at first because pruning involves some pain And so, the husbandman, God the Father, is the pruner. And he'll come to the vine, and he'll look and he'll inspect his vine regularly, and see if us as branches are getting the sap, if we're getting the nutrients, if we're healthy, and if we look a, a little unhealthy or need of some care, he'll clean us up, he'll, he'll, he'll prop us up, sometimes you have to tie it, and then he might start clipping away at some things that don't feel good at the time. And sometimes, and I have found that most of the time, the pruning is a result of issues in our lives that all he's waiting for us to give to him, and then the pruning stops. Most of the time. But sometimes the pruning season can go longer because he's really going to go deep on us and make sure. So this is where I get ready to close and this is where I say to you because remember I told you that the goal is to get the optimum amount of fruit the goal is to be much fruit and multiply but we have to yield to processes don't we our job is to abide our job is to be totally dependent on the vine giving us the, new, the resources that we need. And the Father will come at times and seasons of our life to get more fruit from us. He'll have to prune us. I say all this to say again, to make sure that there's nothing in our hearts or in our lives that we are aware of right now that maybe the Lord has been touching on for a while that we refuse to acknowledge because if we refuse to acknowledge, he'll bring his pruning shears to bring it to light to us in a way that will be more painful if we're not willing to deal with it so that we can abide and be ready for the sap to flow afresh and anew in our lives. And, and here's what the, the end goal is. I'm going to turn to the book of Galatians as I close. Obviously, the end goal is eternity with the Lord. Don't get me wrong. But the end goal is this type of fruit. Let me, let me read you the, the fruit of the, of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and all these things that's not what we want to be right but here is the fruit of the spirit this is the fruit that we're going after love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control that's the fruit. Chapter 5 of Galatians. Verse 22. That's what I want in my life. That's what I want for all of us. Is to be as fruitful. And bear as much good fruit in our lives. As is possible. That's my hope for us as a church. That's what our hope is for you individually, for your families. That there would be nothing in us. And if there is, that we would recognize it and say, Lord, here it is. Remove this rock in my heart, in my soil, so that the sap can flow through again. Remove this issue in my life so that you can flow in me freely like I know you have in the past. 
Because if anything blocks the sap, it's not the vine or the sap, it's the branch not being able to receive it because of something standing in the way in itself. Let's not be those type of branches. Let's be a branch that gives ourselves over to the vine that allows Him to flow in and through us. That allows Him to do His cultivating work in us so that we can be fruit bearers. Amen? So Father, I have given what You have given to me. I have given what You are doing in me. And I ask You today, and we ask You collectively, search our hearts and search our branches, Lord. Lord, if there's anything that's keeping you from flowing in us, through us, because you not only want the sap to flow in us to be fruitful, but you want us to produce fruit for others, and you want us to be a part of a vineyard where our branch, along with other branches, come together and produce maximum fruit for you, and that we flow with sap to other branches around us, offshoots of the vine at times when they're struggling. So today, Father, let us not leave here discouraged, but let us leave here today knowing that you're calling us to be fruitful and to bear much fruit and that we're willing for you and even asking you for the pruning shears of heaven to cut away for the tilling of the ground of our heart to remove the stony places because Jesus gave us a parable of the seed sower who went out to sow seed. Some fell on hard ground and in cracks and some fell on, on good soil, but the ones that fell on the hard ground and the cracks, they may have produced a, a quick amount of fruit, but as soon as the cares of life and the trials of this age came upon them they were scorched out or they were they, they didn't have any root but the good seed takes root and the heart is the soil that you talked about Jesus help us to be mindful of the cultivating work that you want to do in us so that we will bear as much fruit as you have wanting us to bear we ask in Jesus name Amen